mother was a chemistry researcher, still is. My dad was a math teacher, and it was always present somehow. I mean, I was a, a, an only child. But I remember when my, my dad used to give tutorials, um, and sometimes I would sit at the table and just listen to him. Obviously, I wouldn't understand anything he was saying, but I think uh, from a very early age, uh, I started kind of absorbing concepts around science and, and, and maths and chemistry and all that. I was good at maths, so I, I, I had no problem with, with understanding abstract concepts. I, I remember reading a, a book about Einstein very early on, and, and Carl Sagan as well, all the Cosmos books and all that. So I, I really got concepts about the universe and, and, and the stars and all that. It, it was just it was something that appealed to my imagination, thinking about other possibilities. So physics kind of happened like that, and, and, and that's why I decided to then study it. I always liked writing, uh, but I, it, going into humanities didn't really make sense to me. I, I hated grammar anyway, I, I hated rules, I hated all that. So I thought, I'm just going to study physics and the writing will happen eventually, which kind of did. So picking a degree wasn't easy. I, I mean, thinking back, I just, I just went for it. I didn't really think twice about other possibilities. I think actually, I mean, going to physics later for university, yes, but going into science, I, I just, I didn't really know what to pick at the time. So I just decided to copy my friend's application. Uh, and, oh, you're going for that, I'll, I'll go as well. So <laughs> that's how it happened, basically. And my mother, like I said, was a chemistry researcher. She had an affiliation with um, a, uh, the University of Southampton. And she mentioned the possibility to me. Um, and again, I didn't really think, I thought, that sounds like a cool, a good possibility. Uh, I didn't really conceive of applying anywhere else. I just went for it. Um, it, it only hit me that I was going to leave not only my parents' home, but my country at 18, uh, the day before I, uh, I, I went to, to, to England. Only that, I, I, I remember vividly just going, oh shit, I'm, 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 actually, I'm actually doing this. I mean, it's no big deal, but it, it's, it's, it's quite a step change, you know, because if, if you live with your parents until you're 18 and suddenly you leave your country, you leave your friends, you leave your culture, uh, it can be, and you leave your language, it can be quite a drastic change, which it was. Uh, so, but I could, I never really thought about that too much. Only, only hit me when I actually had to face reality. Why are we here? Uh, I mean, if you really think about that, <laughs> it makes no sense. So in, 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 in the studies that I, cosmology is basically about the beginning of the universe, how everything within the universe was first formed and, and, and structured. And, and cosmology tries to, um, to answer some of those questions about the Big Bang, about you know, where matter comes from, etc. So again, quite theoretical, but on the, at the same time, if you realize it, it's quite a deep and profound question about our origins. That is something that Carl Sagan in, in Cosmos always used to talk about, that just to the wonder of, of it all other planets, other, other galaxies, other beings in, in the universe. I mean, just those questions are quite, um, I mean, just thinking about them was something that as a kid, and even now, but as a kid really fascinated me a lot. I originally went to astronomy because I was quite excited about extraterrestrial life. And I think, you know, the moment we discover ex extraterrestrial life, will basically change everything. I mean, I don't mean a full-grown alien, but I mean, finding, you know, simple organisms, that, that in itself will be just, just revolutionary. Um, so, yes, if I go back into physics, maybe that's something I'd like to pursue. So my supervisor was João Magueijo, who was also was a quite famous Portuguese theoretical physicist. And uh, at the time, he, he, he just published his theories about the variable speed of light cosmology. Um, and he'd done a few um, documentaries for BBC. So what I did, I contacted him. And, and he replied. So, uh, and I remember at the time, he said it was, it was quite hard 
you know, uh, being in Pure College. And, and then I, I met him at the open day. Uh, in Pure College had an open day for, for people, prospective students. So I went there and I met him and uh, I guess he liked me because he, he, he gave me the position straight away. I was quite lucky, so and <laughs> me and Roma are still very good friends. Being a physicist and, and being part of a community, being a researcher, writing papers, um, meeting some of the names in theoretical physics at the time, so uh, that's how I first met Stephen Hawking. It, it was quite something very different and very, you, you, as a student, you never think you, you're going to get to that level. So it's quite, a, it's quite exciting to, to see how physics works. You know, it, it's a strange little world and, and with, with different sort of routines and different sort of procedures, but I, you basically learn how to do science. A lot of people first going to a PhD, although they love science, they don't know if they like doing it. So it's a big difference. And I, I discovered, although I liked sort of the process, it wasn't enough. Um, the, it was, I mean, it's, it's hard. Uh, science is hard because when you learn science, you basically, you're learning stuff that's been discovered already. They teach you in a way that uh, it's not about seeking solutions, it's about learning knowledge and facts, which is fascinating in itself. But then in science, the process is the opposite. You have to go into, into the unknown and, and, and try to figure out where the gaps in knowledge lie and then make, come up with solutions and answers, which have never been sort of unraveled before. And that's a difficult process, and, and in theoretical physics even more, because it's very theoretical. It, 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 sometimes you come up with theories and only a decade, years after, he, someone finds the solution experimentally because they're working with theory. And, and when I moved into journalism, I, I found something which is quite different, which is much more connected to people and things that are happening now. In theoretical physics, you kind of are isolated a little bit from reality, or in science sometimes. With journalism, you, you're kind of in reality and you have to write about stuff that's happening now. So very two different realities um, in that sense. You have to separate two things, you know, doubts that you have that fluctuate. I mean, they're normal, we all have doubts about stuff. And I think if you get to a point in your career or something that you're doing where the, those doubts are becoming are undermining sort of who you are and undermining how you feel about everything else. I think that's a pretty clear sign that you need to follow another another path. I mean, um, in my case, I already knew I, I kind of wanted to do journalism, so I had that pool, which was quite strong. Although I didn't know much about journalism in itself, I knew I wanted to write. I had experience writing, so I used to write for the Anjavi. I, I knew I could do writing, I've always done writing. The, the difficult thing was to, to do it in, I mean, I, I'd been in England for a while now, but my English wasn't good enough yet, because I, I was studying physics. In physics, you don't learn how to write, um, so I had to really improve my English to get to a stage where I could be a professional editor and, and journalism, and that, that took a long time. It's, it's crossing the desert without a map because you lose your sense of identity. I think there's a point in, 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 in that journey where you're no longer very good at your native language and you're not very good at the other language as well. It's such a fragile state of mind that you're having to work and write in a, in a language that is not yours. Uh, it, it, it's full of insecurities and, and challenges. It, it's not just getting there, it's, it's ongoing. <laughs> I tried to return to Portugal um, and see if there was any opportunities here as a journalist, but um, because I didn't have a degree here in Portugal, people don't really look at your CV if that's the case. That's not the case in, in the UK. So what I did, I, I started writing for the student newspapers, uh, the student newspaper in Pure College. I stopped spe talking, speaking Portuguese to some to my friends uh, for a year or so. Yeah, I had to switch completely. 
uh, I used to read a lot, but I only started reading in English. It had to be completely 100% obsess obsessive, an obsessive in endeavor, because otherwise I wouldn't be able to, because you know, I wanted to be a professional writer in English. So after my PhD, I had an internship at, um, at an American magazine. They, they had an outpost in London. Uh, and it was quite, it was very interesting. And for the first time I came into contact with American journalism, which is, I think, by far the best. Uh, some of the outlets do amazing, amazing reporting. It, it, it's still hard to find a job in journalism. So for a few months I was applying and getting nowhere. Then my first job was at a magazine, a very specialist magazine called Physics World, uh, which was in Bristol. So that was my first job really, and I was there for a year and a half. And after a year or so, I got someone from Wired got in touch, saying that we're looking for editors, or well, for a specific editor for a, a section of the magazine. And someone gave me, gave the editor my contact, so um, they asked me to, to apply. Specifically, they, they wanted someone who had a scientific background. So I was lucky in that sense, because they were looking, obviously, for someone uh, who knew about a new science. Um, so that's how it happened, basically. It is a big brand, yeah, yeah. Because it's a big brand, I mean, I, I think in the first couple of years, I didn't believe that someone with my background was there. Perhaps my confidence, I think, was when I got promoted to science editor sort of four years into the job uh, and science editor. I had a science on my own. I was also curating Wired Health. And by that time, I already was writing a lot of many long form features. I'd, I'd written about a cover story about Stephen Hawking, for instance. Um, so I think that's when I felt a lot more confident about, okay, maybe I got this now. There's nothing more frustrating for a journalist to, you know, you want to do a story about someone and they said, you know, they can only give you 15 minutes. And you're like, oh, I can't do anything with that. You know, when, you, when you're writing a story, you need that sort of raw material and you need, um, and to get people past that first barrier of getting stuff that they never told before, um, maybe because they get more comfortable with you, Building a story requires that access and requires people to spend time with you, and, and that can be hard. I mean, people are busy. There's lots of stories to tell. I have interviewed a detective who, who invented a formula to uh, chase serial killers. I interviewed Chris Froome, who won the Tour de France several times, and uh, I got a insights into the way he prepares uh, for, for the pain of a Tour de France. I interviewed uh, an economist, Mariana Mazzucato, recently, uh, who basically changed my whole worldview about economics and, and, and what we need to do in, in order to confront some of the biggest challenges that we have as a society. Every single story is not so much just the writing, but you, you learn so much. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm not just saying this because it's a cliche, but you do learn a lot. Um, and that's sometimes what I seek in stories, is, is to seek something that will in, bring me a completely new perspective on, 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 on the world. Um, when I go for an interview, I never prepare questions. Well, I, I, I prepare in general, but it's always a conversation I have with people. With Stephen, I had to send the questions beforehand. Professor Hawking, um, so given the disease he had, um, he couldn't communicate in real time. Actually, part of the story I wrote was a project he had with Intel to sort of speed up miscommunication because it was so slow. As in many other stories I interviewed, it's not so much the person you, you're you profiling, it, it's it's everybody around that person who, who sometimes gives you the more, most insight. It was a unique sort of process. Uh, I mean, it, it just gave me an insight into not just the brilliance of his discoveries, but the brilliance of, because he had to, physicists, to work, they need their hands, you know, to write equations, to or even type on a computer. He had to do it, everything in his head. I mean, imagine doing extremely abstract physics just in your mind. And 
Michael is a um, pioneering neuroscientist, and he discovered that. So we all know that brain, the brain is is a plastic. It's called neuroplastic. So the brain has the ability to change. And Michael was the first neuroscientist to actually uh, find that that applies to adult brains as well. Because before people were saying only children have a plastic brain, but when you get to, to an adult, it doesn't really change. But Michael said actually. Even the adult brain is capable of change, and it also applies to you know when you have all cognitive diseases, uh, the ability for us to 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 heal ourselves, uh, if you do you know what's necessary to actually bring about that change, is quite astonishing. So Mike Mersnick and, and others were developing software at the time. That software trains basically the brain uh, to exercise certain abilities that we have, and, and that was something that, that really change my whole perception about our capabilities and, and how much we because people sometimes think oh, I'm not very good at this I'm not very good at that but Michael was actually you know that we have this whole learning ability uh, as long as we follow a certain certain rules that we can we can fundamentally change ourselves if you're changing your brain you're changing yourself so that that was one and the other was this time a neurophysiologist called John Coates he used to be a Wall Street trader but then he then he gave up Wall Street. This was during the boom and the crash, and um, he went on to study stress, uh, the stress response. Uh, and he went on to study the stress response because he saw that the traders would get into a frantic state of euphoria, and he, he didn't know why. And, and he saw that the male traders would behave quite differently from uh, from women, women on the on the on the trading floor. And he found out that it was basically due to testosterone. Uh, response. Uh, testosterone is a molecule that basically changes the, the way the brain reacts to certain things and you, you get euphoric and you get all sorts of nonsense uh, ongoing and you start taking a lot of risks. But I learned doing, doing that uh, story that stress isn't a bad thing in itself. Stress is really everything that happens to you is, is stress and the body responds to that and the body adapts to it. But stress is necessary if we are to adapt to the environment. By, by that I mean sometimes, well, stress is bad and we need to avoid stress. And, and what John taught me was we actually need stress to become better. And, and this fits a little bit into the neuroplasticity. You need a little bit stress to become better and adapt and become stronger. If the stress is too much, then the body will start actually stop responding and become ill and, and whatnot. But if you give it a peak of stress and then you recover, that's sort of the magic formula uh, to improve and become stronger and, and, and more adaptable. It's the same as going to the gym. If you go to the gym and you lift a certain weight, you're imposing a certain stress, right? And, and, and then you go home and that's when the body goes, oh, okay, you, you've, you've done that. It's like, do you, do you need us to become stronger <laughs> to to lift those weights. So you're asking something for the body, and then the body adapts and you grow muscle. And that, was, um, that was a key lesson about, you know, what, when stress is good and when stress is bad. Um, and it changed the way I see a lot of things as well. After the London Olympics in 2012, I started researching and writing about sports science. Um, obviously, because we had the Olympics, so it was it was we had the occasion um, in UK to and uh, people were open to talk to you about sort of the process of of winning medals. But there was other stories I I, I did after that that kind of kept touching on some of the same points, and and I, I did a story about McLaren. Applied Technologies, which is part of the McLaren group, but they they work with companies to develop sort of processes influenced by Formula One. They also work with Olympic athletes as well um, in designing the bikes and designing sort of uh, uh, in rowing, designing the boats, etc. He also was working with some of the athletes uh, in terms of tracking hormonal states and seeing if people were ready to compete or not. Basically, they would profile the very best in the world, you know, the best team, the best runner, the best athlete in a certain sport. They would profile that athlete extensively, uh, understand his physiology, understand the, 
strategy. And then they will look at their own athletes and say, okay, so this is what we need and this is where we are. So then the process was about understanding the gap between the best in the world and where they were. And what they did as sports scientists was trying to really, they call it gap analysis, really trying to understand where the differences lie in terms of the physiology, the psychology, the mindset, the injuries, the, um, all those processes. And they'll go very detailed into nutrition to try to understand, okay, if we do a little bit here and a little bit there, we're going to get up a level and then they, on the basis of that analysis they will make training programs for four years okay year one year two year three year four and this is going to be the journey and this is the sort of the milestones and this is what we're going to get so they would peak exactly the olympics um and and deliver on on that performance not always but the process was so meticulous and so sort of rigorous and so scientific that it, it uh, and, and the results are, are, are there for everyone to be seen uh, for everyone to see in Rio they were second just just below uh, the United States uh, which was an incredible achievement so leaders need to be aware that the decisions that they make not only are dependent on other factors that it's not their rationality um, but also affect others as well. So for instance, when leaders are very stressed, stressed in a bad way, under pressure, what they tend to do is they tend to put everybody else under pressure just because they want to sort of contaminate, uh, in, in a way, well, want to spread the stress. So leaders need to be aware of their own inner, inner emotional and hormonal responses um, so they can take a step back and then sort of and realize, okay, I'm not my best today. Uh, I'm going to need to, you know, recover or do what athletes do, basically. In the book, I write about recovery. The team won a gold medal in Rio, a field hockey team. They had this thing called social recovery. And it's basically, they, you know, scientists found out that when you're in a social environment where you feel protected, your, your testosterone levels go up, your stress goes down. It, it doesn't mean that it, it, it's such an essential part of recovery to sort of kick back and, and just enjoy being with your friends. And, uh, you know, you're so immersed in your work and you're so busy and you keep pushing back on your commitments with your friends or your social commitments because, oh, I can do them later. That's such a big mistake because you, you, you're missing out on, A, an opportunity to re-energize yourself, but also um, you need to sort of nurture that part of your life. It, it, and again, it's something that athletes know and then and they, and they do it because they, they know their performance depends on that. But you know, people in the corporate world, leaders, sometimes they're not so much aware of it. And the people I admire are people who have built worlds of fiction. I think it's something extraordinary that you can change the world just by something you write. You know, I, I, I fully admire scientists who discover something um, who changes the world, like penicillin or whatever or computer scientists to write the program that everybody uses. All of those endeavors have a lot of technology and science and etc. But, um, you know, someone like J.K. Rowling to write a, a, a little book um, during their lunch break and, and creating a whole industry around Harry Potter, it's sort of magical in a sense because it's just, there's no science or technology involved there. It's just uh, imagination, you know, it's something so intangible but that can change so much.